Good morning, everyone. I'd like to ask you to take your seats and we'll get started at Grand Rounds. Welcome to Grand Rounds. We're still in the uh, early part of our new academic year. Uh, it's great to see everyone here. We know that there are many people on the WebEx uh, communication that uh, goes to our uh, regional centers uh, around the uh, Washington metropolitan region. I want to uh, welcome you to the sixth annual Holbrook Lecture. Uh, we're here today uh, to honor Dr. Peter Holbrook, who's uh, here with uh, friends and joined us uh, last night also at dinner with family. It's great to see Peter again. Peter uh, reminded me yesterday that he's now been part of the Children's National Community for 43 years. Uh, currently, as our professor emeritus and uh, emeritus member of the uh, Division of Critical Care Medicine, uh, Peter had a significant leadership role in our institution for many, many years. He came to uh, the hospital in 1975, I think before it moved to our current site uh, here, and was really a pioneer in the establishment uh, of the Pediatric uh, Critical Care Medicine Division. The, Pediatric Intensive Care Unit here at Children's National. We partnered with uh, folks like Alan Fields and Marty Eichelberger to really develop critical care and trauma medicine in our institution. Uh, Peter uh, went on to be uh, chairman of the Department of Critical Care Medicine and then I believe it was in uh, 1995 was appointed as chief medical officer and really transformed that role in this country in pediatric hospitals into a role that was very different than the previous uh, traditional chief medical officer position. So Peter not only uh, established uh, many of the clinical programs here in our institution, including and especially critical care medicine, but was a real force across the country for critical care medicine and for uh, pediatrics in general. Dr. Holbrook played a a pivotal role in establishing the pediatric training programs for critical care medicine. And I know there are a number of fellows who are in the room and just want to emphasize that in the room you are with one of the true icons of critical care medicine and critical care medicine training in particular. So Dr. Holbrook then went on to be chair of the first uh, sub-board of uh, pediatric critical care in the American Board of Pediatrics. He was on the executive committee of the American Board of Pediatrics, and he also organized the pediatric critical care section in the American uh, Society of Critical Care Medicine as well. So really, really a force in the um, institution, but also in the field of pediatric critical care around the world. So I'd really like to... Thank Peter for joining us again today, for being with us and continuing to um, give us counsel and give us uh, his ideas. Uh, he has uh, challenged us uh, in these lectures to think a little bit uh, differently um, about how we view our problems in our current uh, state uh, of affairs. And so we've had a number of interesting speakers at the Holbrook lecture. Just to, just to remind you a few, we've had uh, uh, conductors of symphony orchestras uh, and uh, admirals in the Navy who were commanders on aircraft carriers. Uh, we've had uh, CEOs of large children's hospitals be the speakers, and we've had uh, really superstars in critical care medicine as well. So there's been a, a diverse spectrum of speakers that have given us uh, perspective and insights that's a little bit different. So this year, we're going to continue that uh, tradition I'd like to remind you that after the lecture, we're going to have uh, a reception just next door in the uh, the Bear Institute, the learning center there. It's just out the door and I think to the left. So please join us there to say hello to Peter and to greet our speaker. But to introduce our speaker, I wanted to let uh, Dr. Robin Steinhorn uh, do the honors. Robin is our senior vice president for hospital-based specialties and has the executive uh, authority and uh, responsibility for large segments of the hospital clinical programs, including those that pertain to these uh, emerging threats uh, in our environment. So, Dr. Steinhorn. It's such an honor and pleasure to introduce to you today Dr. Donna Mazet, who is a professor of epidemiology and disease ecology and the executive director of the One Health Institute at the University of California Davis School of Veterinary Medicine. 
So I thought Dr. Mazette would be our first veterinarian to speak here, and I learned last night she is not. Uh, so Dr. Newman, as many of you know, has a very close relationship with the Smithsonian uh, National Zoo. So a uh, friend and colleague of Dr. Mazette, Dr. Suzanne Murray, uh, was indeed our first uh, veterinarian to speak to teach us uh, between uh, the interactions between uh, four-legged and two-legged uh, patients. Uh, Dr. Mazette's career path is as interesting as it is exceptional. So when she started veterinary school, she thought um, uh, she thought about uh, being a uh, perhaps a zoo veterinarian or uh, 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 or a wildlife veterinarian. Uh, but her eyes were quickly opened uh, to the importance of animals in public health. Wild animals, if you think about it, are exposed to such a great extent to environmental um, influences and toxins. And so she was really inspired to go on and uh, not only get her DPM, but to get a master's degree in preventative veterinary medicine, an MPVM, which is similar to population health in veterinary medicine. The work has grown into uh, understanding and solving global health uh, problems, especially for emerging infectious diseases, a topic that is very important to all of us and conservation challenges. She's active in the international One Health research programs, most notably in relation to disease transmission among wildlife, domestic animals, and people, and what drives disease emergence, again, a topic of such great importance to us. Currently, she's the global director of a greater than $200 million viral emergence early warning project called PREDICT. I suspect we'll hear about that um, today that um, has been uh, developed with the U.S. Agency for International Development's Emerging Pandemic Threat Program. Dr. Mazette, as you might imagine, has an incredibly long list of awards. It would take me an hour, I think, to read all of them, so I'll mention just a couple. Uh, in 2015, she received an award uh, as Research America's Public Health um, Hero. And in 2013, she was elected to the National Academy of Medicine, the highest honor uh, that a, uh, that a uh, uh, medical scientist, a medical provider uh, can receive. Um, and it really, uh, I think, acknowledges the tremendous impact she's had as an innovator um, in this field. And she serves on the National Academy Forum on Microbial Threats and chairs the Academy's One Health Action Collaborative. So I'm really looking forward to hearing uh, Dr. Mazet's uh, uh, tremendous uh, uh, thoughts and uh, contributions to this field. Well, thank you all for coming early and um, taking a break from all of your other activities. And thank you, Dr. Steinman, for that wonderful introduction. I did not send her all of that info, so she went looking for it. Um, uh, it's quite the buildup, but no, um, uh, no, no small buildup compared to honoring Dr. Holbrook, which is uh, incredible. I, I think um, just having a chance last night to talk to him a little bit and um, the, try to figure out how his his mind works and um, looking at all the complexities and different pieces fitting together, it's just an incredible honor to be here and to even be mentioned in the same breath. So thank you, sir, for that. Um, I am here today to talk to you about identifying uh, the next big one. And it sounds to me like this hospital and this system and all of you are really um, forward thinking and have done an incredible job. Um, I, you know, I'm not a kid anymore, but if I as needed to be cared for, I'd certainly want to be here. Um, so it's just amazing to think about how you all are um, on the front line of these issues that I work sort of in, in the background in a different space. And I'm excited to be here to talk to you and to meet you all, um, those of you who can join later, to try and merge those spaces, sort of the, the, the background piece where we're out in the field, and I'll show you some of the glamorous places I get to work, um, to, to get the samples that help us look for the next um, potential pathogen of epidemic and pandemic concerns. 
I think you all deal with this piece as much or more than I do. Um, we know that the public is concerned, your patients and their families are concerned about all of the emerging infectious diseases. A few years ago, I, I was working in this realm, but most people weren't that excited or interested. They thought things like Ebola happened in places that would never touch them. And I don't need to tell you today that people don't feel that way anymore. Um, as we see uh, new influenzas that are of huge concern, um, about the Ebola epidemic certainly, um, you know, we're responding to one right now in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, and, and those things that touch lives very close to home as well, like Zika. I know you have some wonderful expertise here in um, the Ebola and Zika realm. So it, it is this piece that is real and is a concern, but it also causes hysteria, right? I heard some things about what you have to do here um, to protect yourself so that you can care for your patients should there be an outbreak of concern that starts to inflate people's ideas of what they might have. And that is a super big piece to deal with. And when we think about emerging infectious diseases, we have to really think about what's happening in populations and what's happening with the number of people on this planet and where we are living and how we are living around the world. And that is bringing us in closer contact with each other and with the sources of potential new pathogens. And really, when we live closer together, we have an infection control issue. So all of those pieces are connected. What that is resulting in is that we are recognizing at least three new emerging infectious diseases a year. Um, and as we keep growing, we have to anticipate science, history, everything is telling us there's going to be more. I think on the front line, um, and especially working with children, that's where you can notice these new things very quickly. And, um, and so it is working together um, on all disciplines. So obviously, what are you doing here, John, as veterinarian? What are you, you know, why are you here to talk to us about this today? It's only being connected that we're going to be able to avoid pandemic. So if we can get and stop things at the epidemic stage, which is one case, right? Anything above what we expect is epidemic when it's new. So if we can stop it at the one to less than 100 cases, we can avoid that pandemic piece. And so being knowledgeable and having um, these kinds of connections are really what can help us there. Besides lives lost, it is that piece of um, being prepared and then not being prepared that costs us a lot. And so on average, um, we're spending around $40 billion every time we respond to one of these large epidemics. So there's a real economic global cost as well that we can address. Um, the World Bank has been working hard to give us better estimates. If we have a really bad flu, it's likely that that one epidemic could cost us a trillion dollars. And when I say us, I'm talking about the global community, not just um, here in the United States. Um, but if we annualize that, it's looking like we're, the inclusive costs of these epidemics and pandemics are coming to a huge number, $570 billion per year. So we, it, this is a, a real concern for the global economy as well. And everybody's connected now. So this is just an air traffic control pattern. Anybody can get anywhere in about a day. Those of you who try, I know sometimes it takes two. It's not that easy. Um, I'm traveling around a lot too. But um, but unfortunately, the pathogens can move in more quickly than we can because of the way that they, they mix at airports and, and things like that. So about nine years ago, the U.S. Agency for International Development, who has a, a large global health program, said, what can we do to get in front of this? And I, I really think that they're one of the agencies that put their sort of money where all of the academics' mouths have been as far as thinking about one health and thinking about the intersection of human, animal, and environmental influences on global health. And so they made a big investment. 
um, Dr. Steinhorn mentioned. And they said, what can you do? Can you get out there, world, you know, you, you folks out there in the world, what can you do to help us stop at the source these problems instead of letting them get completely out of control? And really, I think under the Obama administration, there was a desire for a forecasting, almost like a weather system for infectious diseases. And I'm sure we all would love that, right? Look, talking about weather today is not great. Um, I would like to get out of here at some point too. <laughs> um, but, um, but when we think about that ability to forecast and say where, when, and what is the next one going to be and what, is, what are its impacts, that's a big challenge. How well do we do it for weather? Yeah, ish, we're pretty good. Right? We're much, much better than we were 100 years ago, even better than we were 10 years ago because the predictive models are getting good. What allows that to happen? The data, right? The data that people are collecting in their weather stations, so they're getting, you know, all the basic stuff, um, the, the amount of rainfall, the temperature and humidity, those things. And then there are people doing more sophisticated collection of that data, combining that. that taken a hundred years. It was about 50 years before the models could even do anything really good. And what I'm telling you is, unfortunately, for infectious disease, we don't have that time. We don't have that 50 or 100 years to collect the data. And for viruses, unfortunately, we're, it's very paltry. We have almost no data. So there is no weather station. And that's what I'm hoping you uh, will agree with me by the end, and we can help our contacts around the world start collecting that information. And it's not very hard, and it's not very expensive compared to those big numbers I was saying before. But it was a challenge that was kind of crazy for anybody to take on. So not very many people actually bid, even though it was this big money for um, this work, because how do you do it? How do you look? There's no diagnostic test for these things. How do you even look to find the next thing? How do you characterize the risk around all of the things that you might find? And that's what we're trying to do now. So um, the PREDICT project that was mentioned is in response to this USAID call and now has grown. And we're seeing CDC, we're seeing um, country governments all around the world, um, we're seeing uh, our Department of Defense really investing in this area, all for their own um, mission but also, I think, for the global good. And so I'm, um, I'm honored to be able to work with the amazing people. Uh, we've been working in about 35 developing nations over the last nine years. Um, and we work with the ministries of health, certainly, but we also work with the ministries of agriculture and the ministries of the environment or wherever the, the pieces where the wildlife intersect with those folks. And sometimes that's the first time those ministers come together and talk about anything. We get them to share data. We get them to share the information on the viruses, where we're finding them, how we're finding them, how they might be transmitted. And so the data, again, is also helping us to sort of break down disciplinary and um, other sort of silos, um, because everybody's concerned about this. Everybody's concerned about this. And again, the, when we think about emerging infectious diseases, I, I certainly do come from a wildlife health background. I am not bringing, I heard the previous great uh, veterinarian uh, grand rounds, they had huge endoscopes and, you know, cases with uh, x-rays of a 20-year-old patient that turned out to be an orangutan. I'm not going to do that, unfortunately. I'm not that cool. I'm, um, I'm, I'm doing a lot more uh, stuff out in the field that, a little more boring and mundane, I swab a lot of butts, let me just say. Um, so don't think you that do that here, I'm with you. Um, it's just different. Um, but I think people to actually go in the back room and bring me a swab, so in their own home. So that's, that's a skill. Um, but uh, the, more, the majority of emerging infectious diseases uh, do come from animals, and that makes sense. How do things, how do we not know about it yet? Well, because probably they're not hurting or infecting people or causing disease too much yet. So we need to be looking at the source of our um, infection. And just like the Europeans brought diseases to this continent and infected the naive human population here, 
we are now globally, the humans are the naive population for those things that can spill over for animals. And most of those emerging zoonoses come from wildlife. And so that's how we made that connection with the wildlife veterinarians, ecologists, public health professionals, MDs working in clinical and research settings. But as I mentioned, the more and more we are growing and moving into wildlands, the more opportunities we have for risk and exposure. The other thing is things we need, like for our cell phones to make them smaller and faster and work well for us, we get from places that people rarely went to before. And they're often places that are like caves filled with bats that might have things that we haven't experienced as humans um, in our sort of immunological evolution. So this is really what we want. We know what's happening out there is that in the green, there are there are viruses out there. And I'm going to sort of just talk about viruses now. We could talk about antimicrobial resistance in the same realm, but I'm going to stick with viruses today. Um, but we know that there are little um, viral cycles happening. Um, things are mixing. And, um, and often, the host, the evolutionary or reservoir host, doesn't get sick. So we might not see you die off, but we might see spillovers. For example, something spills over from one um, taxonomic group, like a monkey, into another, like an ungulate. And we might see animals, antelope, or um, other hoof stocks start to die. And that gives us a little signal. But really, we don't really notice the green curve. We often don't see what's happening in wildlife unless we go look. We notice once it's spilled over into our food supply or the blue curve or into us, humans, and makes us sick, the red. And we often don't notice that until things start to be spread, human to human, and um, we can have different clinicians in different areas say, hey, what's going on here? Um, and that's when we, it's often too late. And so what we're hopeful to do is to move that curve back. So we could be looking and forecasting using the data that comes from the green area, the wildlife piece, and some from the blue area, the livestock piece, um, and also have the tools. So we need the laboratories to be able to pick these things up or recognize them, preferably at their source, not after U.S. or some other um, international group gets involved and exports and does all that, um, because that rarely happens on an emergency basis, in order to be able to shrink that red curve, which is really, really the objective. And so what we did with the PREDICT project is we used the best data we could find in the world. And I mentioned it's OK, but it's not great. It's mostly retrospective based on outbreaks that have happened. So we used that, the best data we could find get it into mathematical models, try to target where we should go looking for these viruses, get the laboratory work done, which is no small feat. I know um, those of you that, you know, are working on your differential diagnoses and you're checking the boxes on what test you want to run, there's no test there. Please check for everything viral that might be causing a problem here, right? You don't have that box. I guess I think you should. I think you could. Um, I think it's, it's the future. Um, but how we get there in an economically efficient way is, is something we really need to think about. Those data then inform our models and the cycle continues. We get better and better at this. And hopefully someday down the line we'll get to that forecasting piece. But I, I, I believe right now we can even do a wonderful job before we get to that sort of detailed and um, fine scale forecasting piece. If, again, we have that sort of, I, and sometimes we talk about a global immune system, of the laboratories and the hospitals that can do the work at the front line. And so combining those data obviously would it drastically, exponentially increase what we have in the pipeline to be able to improve the detection. This is where I work. This is the, we call this one the flu of death slide. So this is where people are um, living and working. This is a, actually in Nepal. This is um, one of the places we kind of go door to door and we get um, people to give us their own samples, their own biological samples, and they let us sample their pigs and their chickens living here together. It's, right, not so good. You don't want the chickens scooping on the pigs and sharing influenza, right? Um, 
So uh, also in this community, there are trues, um, rodents, uh, monkeys, uh, ducks, and um, running around free ranging and foraging in this area. So we sample all of them. And um, we look for genes for AMR and we look for viruses. So this is the kind of interface that is the spot where um, we really need to be searching, where as you can see, um, the biosafety and biosecurity measures are not what we might be hopeful are happening here. So we can talk about all of those, the way things work here too, and some of you probably live in wonderful neighborhoods with backyard chickens and all of those nice things. But um, but but this is really where um, we want to look, and it's not always the things that we can see. So obviously chickens and camels, and we're thinking about um, you know MERS in this one. Um, but it's the ones you can't see. It's also full of bats, uh, and uh, the people are running in and out, and um, more of the camels here are used for recreational purposes, but people do um, drink the camel milk. So these are the, the kind of spots that we work. Also, new industry and occupational exposures. These are um, bat guano farms. And if you build it, they will come. If you want bat guano, it's a, a cottage industry that's really spreading, especially through Southeast Asia. And if you build this nice condo for a bat, you can get them to come. I don't know if you can see in the, in the lower corner there, they're not wearing any kind of PPE or gloves. They're just collecting that guano. We're finding the largest number of new viruses that we think might be infectious to people in bat guano. And these folks not only are putting themselves at risk, if it can go human to human, we're worried about their community, but what are they doing? They're putting it straight on their crop. So it's going straight into the food supply as well. So these are the things that we're worrying about. But we can't sort of be like in our ivory towers and say, don't do that. These people need livelihoods. They, they um, are entrepreneurs. They're doing a great job for their families to support their families. They too want to be safe. Um, and maybe here, as you see in the, in the tall slide, um, putting UV irradiation might work, right? It might kill all of the things that we're worried about. So we need to work together with these communities to test that guano and see if, if we can make small changes like protect yourself while you're working with the fresh guano and then the UV irradiation, we test it and yes, the viruses are dead, then put it on the crop. Don't go straight. You know, so we're looking for those solutions. Otherwise, we also have to look for all new livelihood issues, you know, sources in these communities. We're also doing the science with zoos, with primate centers, to be able to come up with faster, um, uh, effective methods to get these viruses. So these guys are less easy than the people to get their biological sample. And in many places, they're protected, they're endangered, or they're revered um, and worshipped. And so we had to come up with the right media, the right, um, the right swab type that they'll chew on and give me back, um, throw back at me after they're sick of it, um, and, uh, and that we can still get the exact same viruses then if we caught them and exercised them and swabbed them out. So we're able to do that kind of work as well. The diagnostic platform is a little tougher. I'm, I'm sure you have laboratories here that are doing next-gen sequencing and that you can um, jump in. That's a, a wonderful tool, pretty expensive. Hard to deploy in the places in the world, the tropics, where we think most of the new viruses are likely to emerge based on our model. Um, that said, also, not the best, I hate to say, um, method as far as sensitivity for the viruses that we might be looking for. So all the platforms are continuing to improve, and we're working with our colleagues, especially at Columbia University, to continue to uh, make efficiencies and improve sensitivity for things like next-gen sequencing, where you can put a sample and you can click the box, please tell me everything. That's, that's a goal. But there are other um, less expensive ways to do that. And with conventional PCR, um, just looking at uh, consensus sequences for viral families. So instead of looking for Ebola Zaire, for example, we would look for the whole filovirus family and then sequence the positive. We're able to, to get a lot more virus in those viral families that we specify. Now we miss viral families that we're not looking for, but we look for all the ones that have caused epidemics and pandemics in humans in the past with this technology that can be deployed almost anywhere. 
um, and very cost efficient. And I'm learning from my colleagues again all over the world that um, that we can do this work in a much different way. My um, colleagues in Tanzania had one laboratory where they also taught all their their uh, undergrads that are just starting medical school and veterinary school. They use one micro lab um, to do uh, just a little bit of molecular work. And we thought maybe not the best idea to try and look for the world's most deadly viruses in that lab where people were learning to pipette for the first time. So, um, so instead, they said, well, you know, I didn't have, the, it, it's a nice budget, but it was not allowed to be spent on capital outlay. And you have budget people here know how these kinds of grants work. And so we couldn't build labs. Um, but they said, well, we can do something. Can we get the equipment? Can we work with you for that? Yes, we can. So they put together a beautiful molecular lab by stacking two storage containers on themselves and um, making perfect flow inside. It's got its own um, ventilation, air conditioning system, its own backup generator, minus 80, liquid nitrogen, everything, 40 grand. How much does it cost you to build a molecular lab here? Um, so we can learn a lot from our colleagues that have to uh, make things happen in low resource settings. So now, as I showed you the curves before, we're certainly looking in the wildlife there because we need that early recognition. But we also need to move to a place that before we're ready to forecast to say, how can we accelerate this plan? And so syndromic surveillance of people. I mentioned getting the people in their homes to go into their bathroom and get me swabs of all, all sorts of spots. But, um, but we also are working in the clinics that are around those hot spots, like around those guano farms, and looking at fevers of unknown origin and getting all of the metadata associated with their risk, either from them or if they're incapacitated um, from uh, their family members. So we, we do extensive risk surveys from folks with encephalitis, hemorrhagic fevers, and then just fevers of unknown origin, especially with respiratory symptoms. And to date, I think um, it's exciting to look in the bottom corner and say, yes, we've identified about a, a, a thousand viruses. Um, more than 80% of those are unknown previously to humans. So they've been around, but they're new. But do they cause disease? Well, that I don't know yet, right? For most of them, I don't know yet. And so we're looking at the viral sharing with the people. But maybe more importantly right now, it's the training on this side that we've been able to train more than 4,000 people that we work with in ministries, hospitals, um, universities and other partners around the world to be safe and secure while they do this work, to be thinking from a One Health approach, and to be working in more than 60 laboratories um, across the countries where we work. So sometimes human and animal samples are handled in the same lab. In other places, they're, they're separate. We're agnostic about that as long as you're using great um, biosecurity and biosafety. So it's okay to mix, we believe, but that's sort of a new thought process as well. And we're finding viruses in those viral families that we're most worried about. So the coronaviruses, um, when we think about SARS and MERS, um, the filoviruses, I'll talk a little bit more about that, um, the rhabdoviruses, influenzas, paramyxos, all of those viral families. And what, what are those findings? What do they mean? So we can find things like a MERS-like coronavirus, which is basically MERS, um, one deletion. But then we can um, look at where is it, and is it uh, along the pathway of um, the value chain for the camel, um, and is it possibly getting, so we found this one in Uganda. Um, the blue is actually the home range of uh, the most closely related bat we could identify, but the bat was new too. Um, so that's another thing is if you start sampling, you start to pick up the biodiversity, there are a lot of conservation implications. We didn't, hadn't recognized this bat in, in human history either. But the most closely related bat that has built the same niche has that pathway. And you can see um, that's actually the Horn of Africa where most of the camels are bred and sent to the Middle East. And so there's a real transmission value chain and epidemiological link that we can see. But that one, when we get to the structural work, and look at its receptor binding pro probability, it doesn't look like it can infect human cells. So then it starts to go lower on our risk list when we're trying to figure out what to do with these viruses. We also start to find hosts 
and receptor binding affinities in um, in viruses from samples from from hosts that we didn't know. So 10 years after the SARS epidemic, we were able to find horseshoe bats that looked like they didn't need that remixing in the market that people could be infected directly by um, interacting with these bats. So the SARS story, the, the bats came to market and we believe mixed in the civets and then the civets were probably what was transmitting to people. But in this case, in doing this work, we're able to find, well, actually the ones there are some other hosts that could be the sources um, without the remixing. And then just uh, just this last month, we were um, able to report on a new Ebola virus that we identified in Sierra Leone. Um, most all of the filoviruses are able to cause um, human disease and sort of devastating human disease, as you know. But it wasn't Ebola Zaire, if, if those of you who hate trees can bear with me. But, um, but if you'll look, the orange is our new Bombali virus, which is in the um, filovirus family in the Ebola virus genus. And up top is Ebola Zaire, the ones we're worried about right now. Um, but then Sudan, down in the blue, so we're, the one we found is more closely related, it appears, to um, the, the bad actor that we've been worried about recently, but, um, but the other ones are, are right there with it. So what about that one? So then we get into that same work, that receptor work, the structural work, the proteomics, then the um, more advanced genomics, and it looks like it can infect human cells. Now, have we seen an infected human? Not yet, but guess what? We're finding serologic, serologic evidence um, in many spots in Africa that doesn't quite match with Ebola Zaire, and so we're developing the serological tests that look like it might be this one. And just also in the uh, last couple of months, a study was published where, where the investigator said, looks like pigs have some other Ebola virus in this part, and it was the same communities where we found these bats in people's homes. So that's where we have to start improving our risk profile and looking for things before they become the next Zika. And I know Roberta worked hard on this, and um, you guys are doing some amazing jobs. We also have the responsibility to get the information out to the public. So we work with healthmap.org. I don't know if anybody here work, uh, ever checks healthmap, but healthmap has a, a predict site. You can get to through healthmap or through our predict um, dot global website, and you can see all the places that we've uh, sampled animals and the and the different taxonomic groups where we've sampled, including humans. And then when we found viruses in those communities, you can pull that information up as well, and you can link out as you can see here to GenBank and get all the way out to the detailed information on the virus. So we're trying to make that information public as quickly as possible. And then in the communities getting them the information that's useful for them. We use a lot of uh, community engagement. Um, these folks give us a lot of information and they trust us with their samples. We need to get back to them and their clinicians and talk to the, their clinicians about what they might be looking for or should be looking for in their communities. And then for the people, how to live safely, like with the bats in their homes. And, and so we have a whole campaign on um, how to help them live safely, and I can talk to you more about that later. So we have this responsibility. So now we're finding all of these viruses. What do we do with them? What do we do about them? Uh, is it just a, a you know academic pursuit, or is there is there something next? And again, I think I've tried to make the argument that working together, improving diagnostics, um, and and getting the front line working with the back line is incredibly important. But we can also jump leaps forward um, by starting to really um, put some numbers to the risk of the viruses that we found. And in the past, I, I was actually quite frustrated as an epidemiologist. I was like, okay, so now we found the viruses. We should be able to assess risk. Looking in the literature, there's really no data. There's very little. From the virologists, we have the best data. Um, about receptor binding and some other viral characteristics, but very few. We had to go and start collecting the data to get the host information, the environmental information, all of the things including weather, geography, all of those pieces. And we came up with a list of about 40 factors that any academician or clinician or scientist around the world said was 
potentially a risk factor for viruses. And we put those into a matrix, and then we went out to the experts in the world. We asked about 200 experts, about half of them um, went through a, a kind of long exercise of ranking all of the different risk factors. Um, and that it starts to bring in all of these different pieces into a risk ranking um, platform. And we're putting, we're getting ready to launch an app um, along with the paper um, that will help us to get that information, just like health maps, into people's hands. So this, the data here isn't real, but the, the format is, and what we're doing is basically get a risk score that looks just like a credit score, if anybody likes credit karma, um, because it needs to be accessible to citizens, policymakers, all of that. And so you can, you can see all of the viruses. You can sort it by viral family if you like to work on coronaviruses. You can sort it by country or location if you happen to be a policymaker or a public health practitioner in a certain region. You can sort it by host species and start to get, you know, if you're a researcher or a, or a vet or somebody who works with a certain species, you can start to get a handle on that and make maps and everything yourself. You can, so we're ranking all the known zoonotics and all the predict new viruses. And then people, scientists, can upload their own viruses. Fairly easily, we pull most of the data on the risk factors from public sites. We just need a few pieces of information about where they're finding it and what kinds of interfaces are in those areas. And they can upload and start to sort of citizen science this thing. Um, I wanted to say something. I'll, I'll, I'll save it a Matt Damon quote, but um, but uh, yeah, we can do that. Uh, and um, the other things we're finding is through Predict, we're starting to figure out and identify how many samples we need to take to find all the viruses in the world, because we've done a poor job in science of even looking for viruses. I, I'm sure um, those of you who have to treat patients with viruses, you know we've done a pretty poor job in figuring out how to do that as well. And we need the data, just like the forecast, to be able to come up with some better therapeutics, better vaccines, for goodness sake, so that we don't miss um, the right strain. So collecting that information is critical, but how do you start? Where do you go? Um, so the PREDICT project, while I thought it was a big project, I was sort of proud, you know, that it was a large scale, is now being called a pilot. Um, it's, it's a pilot for a bigger effort that we're calling the Global Virome um, Project, which is just an initiative, just an idea right now. But we do now have the ability to know how many samples from how many species, and we'd like to do it all over the world, but where we should start to get our biggest bang for the buck. Um, there are about 111 viral families known to people, about 24 of those is actually can infect people that we know of so far. Um, and when we started, there were only about 385 viruses um, known to have infected humans. I mentioned 200 because that's where we have actually the, the information on how they were transmitted. Um, so there are probably about 1.6 million viruses out there yet to be discovered, but we think only about half a million of those, I know it sounds terrible because we know only a few hundred, but only about half a million of those um, will be likely to be able to infect humans, and even fewer will be able to um, to cause disease. Now, that sounds a little audacious, right? But I will tell you, we can do that for 10% of what it would cost to respond to one outbreak, okay? So it is in the Bs, it is in the billions, um, but for four billion we could probably get all of it, and for one billion we could get almost all of it. Because as you go out and keep looking harder and harder, that costs you a lot of money. So if you wanted to get about 80% of all of those viruses, you could get that for just over a billion dollars. Which, frankly, WHO says, oh, that's a drop in the bucket. You could do, you know, we could afford five. They don't have it. They get it from other countries. So it, it's kind of um, easy to say. And I can tell you it's not that easy to find billions of dollars to do this work, but I do uh, believe it will save lives and um, save costs down the line. And we're working on that economic modeling um, to see that. So that would allow us to develop this global database of almost all um, the naturally occurring viral threats. Um, it also will allow us to continue to improve our diagnostics um, and then hopefully down the line 
um, it will allow us to improve our um, therapeutics and vaccines. Because if we know, you need to know which ones have the ability to infect humans but don't cause disease alongside which ones have the ability to affect humans and cause the disease. If we can figure out the difference there and we can start to figure out how much change is needed in that viral evolution or remixing, we can start to target the right spots on these viruses for some of our, um, our therapeutics. And that, that's really way down the road, unfortunately, but the more we work together, the faster we can get there. We are working with some of the best experts in the world that we can find who are willing, and most of them are, in artificial intelligence um, and scouring all of the data, the big data in the world to try and accelerate this as well. So I think um, the motivation is there. So we'll go back to my first slide with all the scary stuff on the front of time. That, that is motivating, unfortunately. I would like to get to the place where people aren't scared, where people know what's out there and they're able to um, be informed, especially our health systems are able to be informed and ready. I think you guys are doing an amazing job. I just heard about some of the, the wonderful measures you have um, for infectious disease control and ability to quarantine, the work you've done with potential Ebola patients already, the research and the science that you're doing for Zika, combining that with your neonatology, your neurology, all the amazing things you have here, that's what we just like to sort of expand those collaborative lines um, uh, to do even, you know, more work together and accelerate the pain. The other bit, just back to now, you know, again, no big endoscope for a giraffe, but it does allow us to identify a lot of information for the world that we don't know, like the new bat species, we are barcoding and looking at all of the information on the host, and that helps us to understand what's going on in our world, understand our biodiversity, what needs to be protected. And, and bats, I mentioned bats a few times. I don't want to vilify bats. Bats are important. We need pollinators. Um, we're having a bee collapse. You know, we need food, right? I, I think you all want to eat fruit and things like that. So we need the pollinators. We need um, we need the insect control that we get from bats, so we don't want people's response um, to the bats or, or for influenza to the birds um, to just think that the right thing is to go out and kill them all. Um, we will destroy our planet if we're not careful. So there are a lot of unintended consequences that, um, again, as we work together, we can help to avoid. So that's, that's what I wanted to share with you today. Um, I'm, Certainly happy to um, talk to you more, answer some questions now, and then more one-on-one uh, -on -one, uh, if you'd like to get involved. Thank you very much. That was a wonderful lecture. Uh, my question is about the uh, uh, potential use of uh, social media and uh, uh, searches and things like that yeah. in this. You know, obviously, recently uh, it's been found that searches are actually better than the CDC yes. following uh, uh, flu epidemics. Mm -hmm. Is there something similar uh, that one could use in, in uh, these resources? Uh, of poor countries? Absolutely. So there, there's a couple different things. One is a bit of a language issue um, that's a problem. So I mentioned Health Map. We're working with um, Boston children and the, the Health Map folks uh, from Harvard to do just that. They, they do the flu near you. They're the ones that say, look, this is better. Um, and they're, they're in this kind of environment, they're doing some amazing work, even just, you know, like, food safety with, you know, how people get Grubhub and Uber food delivered and saying, you know, who then goes to, you know, there's some privacy issues there. Um, but uh, but uh, but the, the minds are incredible for that. Um, we tried together with them in, um, again, some of these other uh, developing nations where in some countries maybe 30 languages are spoken, uh, it becomes very difficult. The systems aren't set up yet but I'm sure it will get there very quickly 
um, to be able to spread that. So we did a, a project where we had our team. So we have, you know, obviously teams running around um, doing all this sampling. We have great team members like drivers and um, folks that have a lot of downtime. So we asked them, you know, we're, we're all about efficiency. Remember the $40,000 lab. Like, there's no sitting around on this project. So um, while they're sampling and you've driven them there, on the way, please buy every newspaper you can buy and please scrub it for us because the computer can't quite do it yet. And we're able to pick up from them watching their news in the different languages as well as reading the newspapers uh, a bunch more signal um, that we also work with the ProMed folks. Um, and we scrub from the ProMed side and we add to, we do the ProMed posts. And our drivers were so incredibly happy because they were saying like, look, I, I, I'm getting posts on ProMed because they're uploading. The other thing is a lot of the signal is noise and um, having the folks on the ground and being networked, um, even hopefully after PREDICT, these folks will still be working in their ministries and their universities. Being networked on the ground, there. I can, and I'm sure many of you too that do international work can almost instantaneously by the a report or a ProMed or something, call someone in that country now on WhatsApp, social media, either voice WhatsApp or, or, um, or text and say, does this look real? Who's in that town? Can, it, it, you know, and almost like a huge percentage of the time, there are things that happened months and months ago, and that's what we can't have anymore. We need to make that real time if we're going to catch things before they get out of control. Yeah. Hi, uh, thanks for the talk. Um, in your discussion of uh, One Health and PREDICT, you are concentrating for this lecture mostly on human health and health of um, wild and domestic animal populations. But I'm sure that you also have to address the non-biotic or abiotic factors, mm -hmm. uh, ocean temperature, pollution, <coughs> precipitation patterns, what happens to land and soil when it's no longer uh, arable and available okay. for agriculture. Yeah. And then also uh, botanical health. Uh, certainly if there were a, um, uh, a plague were to hit a crop, that could cause uh, as much or more devastation as any uh, viral pathogen that are in the human population. Absolutely. It's a great point. And again, today, you know, we were a little bit focused on this piece, but um, the, the drivers, all of those things that make you lose a crop, many of those drivers are the same things that, that stress systems and allow for spillover and emergence of new pathogens. So they're very connected. And it, it's the there are social drivers and environmental drivers that are key to our models as well that we're pulling in. Um, uh, climate is a big one. It's hard to get our hands around it, but I feel like by being out there and collecting all this data as we're um, sampling the people and the animals, we're also collecting the data that will help inform some of those models, um, working with the teams that are, like I mentioned, the, the, those public data sources improving those data sources because those are what's going into the risk analysis. So thank you for, for bringing that up. Also at UC Davis, um, Robin mentioned that I'm the director of the One Health Institute. Within the institute, we have six centers, and our newest center is the Center for Planetary Health. So in One Health, we've tried really hard to bring the human, animal, and environmental health sectors together. The environmental piece has been the hardest one, um, both because of unequal distribution of resources and the environmental sector, what they, they have money to spend on is usually not health. Um, so it's really hard to um, get them to the table. And frankly, because the human and uh, animal health folks have not been that welcoming. Um, have, there are just language problems and that cause um, sort of a lack of transdisciplinary respect. And so we're really, working on that as well. And um, I think the planetary health movement will help us there um, because it's really uh, putting the environmental piece up front instead of the human health up front, which has been uh, some of the criticism of some of our other efforts. I want to put a plug So, on that note. Um, if there are any uh, folks that are interested or you have fellows or um, residents or trainees that are interested more in this, we do offer now, we've done it two years in a row, a transdisciplinary course where the, the um, objective is to 
build cadres of people who want to work together and also have that transdisciplinary respect. It's about a four-week course. Um, we offered it the first time in Rwanda and Tanzania last year. We did it all in Tanzania. But it's a, a four-week immersion program for um, for professionals, early early to mid career professionals, um, because there's a lot of camping. I don't mean to know this, so um, just putting it out there. It, you don't have to be early or mid, but you have to be uh, flexible um, about your lodging. <clears throat> so um, they and they get exposure to the lab, to the field. Um, PPE, donning and doffing, um, all of those different uh, pieces. But in a um, developing country context and working and seeing what biosecurity and biosafety looks like in those contexts um, and, um, you know, making those connections. So. Thanks again for mm -hmm. a wonderful lecture. And I think for the fellows and the residents, I think the coolest thing about this is that it brings together the molecular and the high tech and the big data but remembers that it's on the front lines too, that where we find these signals. And so a lot of times the fellows will be up in our office. We have a lot of ID fellows and they'll say, God, it's so weird. We saw like seven of these weird, you know, cases and then they move on to the next topic. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, I just heard you. And I come out and <laughs> remind everyone, you know, that's the time even as a frontline clinician to come out and call the health department or call us. And that's how West Nile was described. You know, all the docs in New York said, holy cow, we have like eight encephalitis of the day, what's going on? So I think, you know, the big tech is so important, but the low tech is equally important, um, and to bring them together is just fabulous. So. And thank you for the West Nile plug. You know, that was a uh, Zubet oh. pathologist that actually identified it as West Nile because the birds were dying. And so it was thought to be um, one of the regular EEs, and, um, and yeah, the birds uh, Tracy were dropping McNamara out of the sky, identified right? that it was yeah. West Nile, yeah. Can I ask one more question too? Or are we out of time? Um, so I was really interested when you said when you're doing the surveillance and finding new viruses that potentially cannot go to human, how do you then sort out the, because there's lots of viruses like that, but then there's a sudden mutation yeah. and it does go to human. Right. So do you look for patterns in certain non-structural gene segments or something? Or I think that's the future. I, I, um, I know you have a good relationship with the NIH and especially NIAID, and I think um, they, they're looking at that and, and willing. So this is really foundational material for future research, and, um, and it's incredibly important future direction. We're not there yet, I would say, um, but that's where we need to go. Uh, so I'll remind you, we have a reception uh, that will be in the Bayer um, Institute. I can see there's still a lot of questions, so you can um, ask those. And I'm going to let Dr. Newman have the last word. Well, John, thank you uh, for just a spectacular um, uh, presentation and uh, really exciting. A lot of us, here we are in Washington, D.C. Uh, uh, we're in the perfect location to uh, play a role, and we have a lot of our leaders that are already engaged. But uh, when we think about uh, all of the um, uh, intersections here, you mentioned the NIH, all the government agencies, the embassies, uh, the Smithsonian, uh, and I know your close colleague, Dr. Murray, and, and her work um, uh, that uh, make it a natural to uh, uh, work with you. and. Uh, you know, we, we love the fact, um, I learned last night, I wasn't aware, but uh, I am now that UC Davis is the number one oh, uh, veterinary school. It, 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 there was it, a big debate last night. Big debate. Uh, <laughs> there she is. Uh, uh, Tufts, <laughs> Tufts, University of Pennsylvania, Virginia Tech are close behind, but uh, uh, but we, oh, you uh, better put Cornell in there. They're going to get Cornell, uh, that's right. <laughs> but, uh, and, and just seeing uh, that interdisciplinary institute that you've created um, at UC Davis is the kind of uh, collaboration and partnerships um, we here at Children's National want to uh, foster and participate in. So uh, that's another side of it, of how you have, uh, in a very uh, open and broad, ecumenical, inclusive way, uh, at your own institution, across the United States, around the world, and um, it's just very, very inspiring. Uh, so thank you. I know that's the way Dr. Holbrook thought about uh, critical care medicine and the great 
uh, program that uh, he and his colleagues uh, uh, built here. And so we look forward to working with, with you very closely in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you.